In this module, we will explore the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. Once completed with this module, you should be able to describe the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. The respiratory system is of critical importance to the human body as it provides the means by which oxygen enters and carbon dioxide, the waste product of cellular activity, leaves the body. The respiratory system also plays a part in defending the body against disease while additionally serving a role in regulating the body's acid-base balance through the exhalation of carbon dioxide. Oral communication is also made possible through the structures in the respiratory system. In evaluating the respiratory system, it is common to divide the system into two parts, the upper respiratory tract, or upper airway, and the lower respiratory tract, or lower airway. The dividing line between the two falls at the glottic opening where the vocal cords are located. The upper respiratory tract contains the nose, mouth, tongue, jaw, oral cavity, larynx, and pharynx. We will discuss these structures in more detail shortly. These structures perform a multitude of functions that also incorporate components of other bodily systems such as the digestive and nervous systems. As far as the respiratory system is concerned, the structures of the upper airway serve as a path for air to enter and leave the body. They also play a role in cleaning particulates and other foreign bodies out of the inhaled air while also warming and humidifying the air. Below the glottis lies the lower respiratory tract. The structures of the lower airway include the trachea, bronchial tree, and lungs. While part of the lower respiratory tract is responsible for the movement of air between the upper airway and the lungs, along with the removal of foreign materials, the primary function of the lower respiratory tract is the exchange of gases between the inhaled air and the body's circulatory system. The details of how this works will be discussed later in this module. In our exploration of the structures of the upper respiratory tract, we will begin superiorly where the air enters the body from the external atmosphere and work our way down inferiorly. The nose is the primary passage through which air enters and leaves the body. The part of the nose that we see on the face consists of skin and related tissues over cartilage and some bone. Inside the nose are two nasal cavities that are separated along the midline, typically by the nasal septum, a rigid structure comprised of cartilage and the ethmoid and vomer bones. If someone has a deviated septum, that means the septum does not sit midline, which could be a consideration when inserting a nasal airway. The interior of the nasal cavities are lined with ciliated mucous membranes that serve to remove contaminants from inhaled air. If someone were to have a cold, for example, the nasal mucosa will increase production of mucus to hopefully trap any additional infectious agents within the inhaled air. These mucous membranes can be easily injured by foreign bodies introduced into the nasal cavity and tend to bleed considerably given a very rich blood supply. There are a set of bony protrusions in the nasal cavity called turbinates that extend from the lateral walls of the nasal cavity into the passageway that increase the surface area of the nasal mucosa. These turbinates create airflow turbulence in the passageway that aids in humidifying the inhaled air while also increasing the likelihood that airborne particulates are captured by the nasal mucosa. Olfactory receptors are present in the nasal cavity's epithelium to process odors. As discussed in a previous module, there are numerous openings along the lateral walls of the nasal passageway that extend into the frontal, maxillary, sphenoid, and ethmoid sinuses. Known as the paranasal sinuses, these void spaces not only reduce the overall weight of the skull, but they assist in providing resonance for the voice. They serve a role in preventing contaminants from entering the airway, and they are pathways for fluid to and from the Esuchian auditory tubes and tear ducts. Because of these functions and features, it is not uncommon for the sinuses to become infected or serve as a source of infection to the ears. The area behind the nasal and oral cavities is referred to as a pharynx. The pharynx is separated into three different areas, the nasal pharynx, the oral pharynx, and the laryngeal pharynx. The nasal pharynx is the area posterior to the nasal cavity that extends inferior to the level of the soft palate. 
The soft palate is the roof of the mouth, which separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. There is a hard palate toward the anterior that is structurally supported by bone, the maxillary bone in particular. Toward the posterior, the palate is called the soft palate because the anterior bone terminates and the separation between the nasal and oral cavities is maintained by soft tissues, including muscular fibers, mucous membranes, and mucous glands. When a person swallows, the soft palate moves upward, forming a seal between the nasal pharynx and oral pharynx to prevent food from moving back up the nasal cavity. Inferior to the nasal pharynx is the oropharynx, which is the posterior portion of the oral cavity that is visible when looking into the rear of a person's mouth. As far as landmarks are concerned, the oropharynx extends superiorly from the level of the soft palate and extends inferiorly to the epiglottis. Unlike the nasal cavity, the oral cavity is designed to not only serve as a pathway for air, but it is also part of the digestive system and is a structure by which the body intakes and begins the processing of food and liquids. With this in mind, there are numerous nerves located within the oropharynx that are responsible for a person's gag reflex, which is designed to provoke coughing or retching, gagging, to prevent the aspiration of food or liquids into the lower airway. Proceeding inferiorly is the original pharynx, the shortest of the three subdivisions of the pharynx. It sits between the epiglottis and the esophagus. While part of the upper airway, the laryngeal pharynx is also part of the digestive system in that food and liquids also pass through the laryngeal pharynx to the esophagus as opposed to the larynx, which is a respiratory structure attached to the bottom of the laryngeal pharynx anterior to the esophagus. The larynx sits between the pharynx and the trachea. It is a landmark denoting where the upper respiratory tract ends and the lower respiratory tract begins. The larynx and its structures serve three primary functions. The first is to serve as a passage for air from the upper respiratory tract to the lungs. The larynx is reinforced, if you will, by several pieces of cartilage that are connected together by muscles and ligaments. The thyroid cartilage is the largest cartilage structure of the larynx sitting anterior on the larynx. This piece of cartilage is often referred to as the Adam's apple. The glottic opening sits behind, posterior, the thyroid cartilage. Directly inferior to the thyroid cartilage is the cricoid cartilage. This piece of cartilage forms a ring that encompasses the larynx circumferentially, which is different than the pieces of tracheal cartilage inferior to the cricoid cartilage that are C-shaped without forming a full ring to the posterior so as to accommodate the esophagus and its need to be flexible to permit food to pass through unencumbered. The cricoid cartilage is considered to be the bottom of the larynx, with the trachea and its tracheal cartilage rings located inferior to the cricoid cartilage and the larynx. In between the thyroid and cricoid cartilage is a cricothyroid membrane. When performing a cricothyrotomy, this is the membrane through which the paramedic makes an incision. The second function is to protect the airway from foreign particles, food and drink in particular. This function is facilitated by the epiglottis, which is a flap of cartilage and tissue attached to the thyroid cartilage. The epiglottis typically remains upright when at rest, allowing air to flow through the larynx between the lungs and the upper respiratory tract. When a person swallows, however, the epiglottis folds back to cover the larynx and prevent food or drink from entering the larynx and the lower respiratory tract. Immediately inferior to the epiglottis in the larynx is the voice box, the area of the throat in the larynx that consists of the vocal cords. The voice box and the structures within it are responsible for the third main function of the larynx, producing sounds and speech. Within the voice box is the erythenoid cartilage, which serves as a posterior attachment point for the vocal cords, along with the vestibular folds, referred to as false vocal cords, and the vocal cords themselves. The opening between the vocal cords is called the glottis, or glottic opening. If irritated, such as by the aspiration of a foreign body into the larynx, the vocal cords will spasm, known as laryngeal spasm, and close to protect the airway. Continuing the journey inferior to the larynx, one encounters the structures of the lower respiratory tract. The trachea, also referred to as the windpipe in layperson's terms, is a tube comprised of C-shaped cartilaginous rings, smooth muscle, and connective tissue that extends inferior from the larynx until it splits at a point known as the carina into two primary or mainstem bronchi. 
The trachea lies anterior to the esophagus and is lined with columnar ciliated epithelial tissue and goblet cells that produce mucus that covers the linings of the airways. Ideally, foreign bodies and particulates are captured by the mucus, which is subsequently pushed up and out of the airway by the cilia to be swallowed and processed by the digestive system or simply expelled from the body by a cough or other expectorate process. The right and left main stem bronchi that break off from the trachea undergo several subdivisions themselves to form a bronchial tree in each lung. The right main stem bronchi is shorter and wider than the left. It also descends from the trachea at a more shallow angle than the left main stem bronchi, which means intubation attempts that are too deep tend to occur into the right main stem bronchi. As the bronchial tree extends throughout the lungs, the branches of the tree diverge with greater frequency and become smaller until the smaller bronchi become bronchioles. The cartilage, ciliated tissues, and goblet cells of the trachea extend into the bronchi and gradually diminish through the bronchial tree until reaching distant bronchioles made up of smooth muscle and elastic fibers that lack the support provided by cartilage. These bronchioles then terminate into small respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli, which is where actual gas exchange occurs within the lungs. At the end of the respiratory bronchioles and alveolar ducts are the individual alveoli, which are often equated to a collection of little balloons at the end of a straw. Several alveoli together form an alveolus. The alveoli themselves are composed of a single layer of epithelial tissue and elastic tissue. When stretched due to expansion during inhalation, the walls of the alveoli thin out even further, facilitating the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air in the alveoli and the network of pulmonary capillaries that line and surround the exterior surface of the alveoli. This exchange occurs across what is known as the alveolocapillary membrane, which is a single layer of cells that lie between the alveolus and the capillaries. As blood flows through the pulmonary capillaries from the pulmonary artery, carbon dioxide passes across the alveolocapillary membrane from the blood into the air within the alveoli, while oxygen passes in the opposite direction, restoring oxygen to the blood supply that returns to the heart through the pulmonary vein. There are two types of cells associated with alveoli, type 1 and 2 pneumocytes. Type 1 pneumocytes are alveolar cells that are virtually empty, resulting in more efficient gas exchange. These cells lack the ability to reproduce, however. Type 2 pneumocytes are alveolar cells that have the ability to produce type 1 cells along with a lipoprotein complex substance known as surfactant. This pulmonary surfactant helps the alveoli maintain their compliance, the ability to stretch, and it prevents the alveoli from collapsing in on themselves during exhalation, and it works to maintain dryness in the alveoli by reducing service tension within the alveoli. If an alveoli or other airway collapses, surfactant is also critical in the body's attempt to try and restore those airway structures. If an alveoli lacks surfactant due to fluid buildup, for example, they are more likely to collapse. Collapsed alveoli or those filled with fluid like water or pus cannot participate in gas exchange. If an alveoli lacks type 2 pneumocytes due to damage, such as chronic cigarette smoking or infection, it cannot repair itself nor can it produce surfactant, which will result in the alveoli collapsing as well. If enough alveoli become deflated or fill with fluid, a condition known as atelectasis, a complete or partial collapse of the entire lung or area of the lung, will occur. Deoxygenated blood that passes such a collapsed or otherwise impaired alveoli will remain deoxygenated. If this occurs in enough alveoli, hypoxemia will result. The human body has two lungs, one in each of the two pleural cavities in the chest, left and right. Inferiorly, the lungs rest on the diaphragm. Superiorly, the apex of the lungs is just above the clavicle, with the apex of the left lung being slightly superior to the apex of the right lung. Each lung is divided into lobes, with the right lung having three lobes, an upper, middle, and lower, and the left lung having two, one upper and one lower. 
there is a notch in the left lung called the cardiac notch, which is where the heart sits within the chest cavity. Each lung resides within a double-layered serous membrane called the pleura. The outside portion of the pleura, the part connected to the chest wall itself, is called the parietal pleura. The inside portion of the pleura attached to the lung itself is called the visceral pleura. In between these two layers of membranes is a pleural fluid that creates surface tension to attach the parietal and visceral pleura to each other while also reducing the amount of friction between the two layers, thus allowing them to glide over each other as necessary to support the expansion and contraction of the chest and lungs during respiration while also ensuring the two membranes expand and contract in conjunction with each other. The pleural space between the parietal and visceral pleura is very small in terms of volume, containing only about 2-10 milliliters of pleural fluid within it. The parietal and visceral pleura meet at the hilum, a wedge-shaped area on the central, medial aspect of each lung where bronchi, arteries, veins, and nerves enter and leave the lungs. Ventilation, the physical act of breathing, moving air into and out of the lungs, occurs because of pressure changes within the chest. The lungs do not have muscles and as a result cannot move on their own. Rather, the movement of the diaphragm and other accessory muscles of respiration create negative pressure in the chest, allowing air to flow into the lungs. While a person can typically exert conscious control of his or her breathing, the process of ventilation is usually automatic and involuntary. The way this typically works is that the chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata, located within the upper brainstem, detect elevated levels of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. This results in nerve impulses being sent across the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm and the intercostal nerves to the intercostal muscles, resulting in their contraction. The diaphragm flattens and moves downward, inferior from the chest cavity, while the intercostal muscles pull the ribs up and out. This increases the inner thoracic area within the chest cavity, thus reducing the pressure within it. Because the atmospheric pressure external to the body is higher than the now lower intrathoracic pressure within the chest cavity, air enters the lungs. Once air enters the lungs, the process of respiration can occur. Unlike ventilation, which is the physical movement of air into and out of the lungs, respiration deals with the cellular and molecular level to encompass the exchange of gases between the person and the environment. Looking specifically at the lungs and alveoli, external respiration is the exchange of gases between the air in the alveoli and pulmonary capillaries, with oxygen passing from the air in the lungs into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide, the waste product from cellular respiration, exiting the bloodstream through the pulmonary capillaries and the alveoli into the air within the lungs for exhalation. In a different module related to respiratory emergencies, we will explore something known as VQ mismatch, where VQ refers to ventilation and perfusion. While we already know what ventilation is, given the definition at the start of this particular slide, perfusion is the process by which the cells of the body receive oxygen. The important thing to recognize here with regard to a ventilation perfusion, VQ disturbance, or mismatch is that it can be possible for the physical act of ventilation to occur with air entering and leaving the lungs without respiration, gas transfer, occurring in the lungs or within the cells of the body. Scientifically speaking, the physical mechanism of breathing is relatively simple given differences in air pressure between the atmosphere and the space within the lungs. It should not be a surprise, however, that the mechanical process of breathing is a little more complex than simply addressing a disparity in pressures between the atmosphere and the space within the lungs. While it is easy to think of the air around us as being weightless, given as how our atmosphere surrounds us and we simply exist within it, the air itself does indeed have weight. All of those molecules of oxygen, nitrogen, and other gases in the air have mass and, when pulled down to the earth by gravity, generate something known as atmospheric pressure, which is the amount of pressure the atmosphere exerts on the surface of the earth or whatever it is touching. At sea level, with a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters or 29.92 inches of mercury. 
Thinking of it another way, our atmosphere exerts about 14.7 pounds of force per square inch on whatever it touches at sea level. As elevation above sea level increases, atmospheric pressure decreases, which becomes important for the paramedic to remember when elevation becomes a factor in the treatment of a patient. There is something known as Boyle's Law, which states that, given a constant temperature and amount of gas, the pressure of that gas is inversely proportional to its volume. Therefore, if you increase the volume of a container, such as the lungs, without increasing the amount of gas within that container, the pressure of that gas within the container is reduced. In referring to the lungs as our container for gases, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, the pressure within the lungs in airways is known as intrapulmonic pressure. Increase the size of the lungs without adding air, and the intrapulmonic pressure within the airways drops. Inversely, compress the lungs and positive intrapulmonic pressure results. Hold on to that thought as we will tie this all together in a moment. As already discussed, the lungs are contained within a double-walled sac known as the pleura. There is actually a small space between the parietal and visceral pleura that has its own pressure gradient that is typically slightly less than atmospheric pressure. The importance of this intrapleural pressure will become evident in just a moment. When we inhale, the diaphragm contracts, pulling down inferiorly toward the feet. This movement of the diaphragm pulls down on the parietal pleura. As the accessory muscles of respiration engage, expanding the chest cavity, the parietal pleura is pulled away from the lungs laterally as well. The intrapleural pressure between the parietal and visceral pleura is lower than the intrapulmonic pressure, which is typically also lower than atmospheric pressure. As the parietal pleura is pulled away from its resting position, it increases in size, and viscous pleural fluid in the intrapleural space pulls the visceral pleura along with the parietal pleura, thus expanding the size of the lungs. Because the lungs expand, assuming everything else is equal, Boyle's Law tells us that the pressure in that intrapulmonic space must decrease inversely to the expansion in the size of the container, the lungs. This creates a pressure gradient between the lungs and airways and the atmosphere itself. As these two systems, the lungs and the external atmosphere, want to be equal to each other, air from the atmosphere flows into the lungs, filling the expanded area with additional air. When we exhale, it is the process in reverse. The diaphragm and other accessory muscles of breathing relax, thus decreasing the size of the thoracic cavity. This, in turn, creates a positive pressure within the lungs as the proverbial container for the air is shrinking. To maintain equilibrium with the environment, the air in the higher pressure lungs flows out into the lower pressure environment. This exhalation ends when the intrapulmonic pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. Given the slight negative pressure within the pleura, the visceral pleura remains close to the parietal pleura and the chest wall. Without the slight negative intrapleural pressure, the lungs would continue to collapse after exhalation. This is actually one of the problems with a pneumothorax, a respiratory emergency that any EMT should be familiar with and will be discussed in another module, where that slight negative intrapleural pressure is lost and the lung on the affected side does indeed collapse. This mechanical process drives what is known as external respiration, the exchange of gases between the alveoli and capillaries in the lungs. When we inhale, the negative pressure in the lungs, the negative intrapulmonic pressure, pulls oxygen-rich air in from the environment. This oxygen then diffuses across the alveoli into the capillaries, while carbon dioxide, the waste product of internal respiration, moves in the opposite direction. Then, when we exhale, the positive pressure created results in the air leaving the lungs, expelling the excess carbon dioxide that was just mentioned. As we are talking about moving air into and out of the lungs, some definitions regarding pulmonary volumes is now prudent. Tidal volume is the amount of air inhaled or exhaled during a normal breath. In an adult, that is about 500 to 600 milliliters of air. Minute respiratory volume, abbreviated MRV, is the amount of air moved over the course of a minute. 
Mathematically, the MRV is calculated by multiplying the tidal volume by the person's respiratory rate. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that can be forcefully inhaled over and above the tidal volume. In a healthy adult, this could be anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 milliliters. The expiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that can be forcibly exhaled from the lungs after the tidal volume is exhaled. This can be around 1,200 milliliters in an adult. Vital capacity is essentially the sum of the tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and expiratory reserve volume. It is the volume of air moved with the deepest inspiration and expiration. For many adults, this can be in the neighborhood of 4,600 milliliters. The residual air volume is the amount of air that remains in the lungs after a forced expiration. Keep in mind that the lungs do not collapse in on themselves upon expiration, nor does the atmosphere suck all of the air out of the lungs. Therefore, assuming normal circumstances, even after a person tries to expel as much air as possible from the lungs, there will still be air remaining in the lungs. For most adults, this residual volume of air in the lungs is around 1,000 to 1,200 milliliters. If you have ever had a pulmonary function test, these capacities are measured for you as an individual. Breathing normally will identify your tidal volume, which allows the MRV to be calculated given your respiratory rate of the number of breaths per minute. That big inhale calls upon your inspiratory reserve volume. The big exhale to the point where you cannot exhale anymore determines your expiratory reserve volume. Vital capacity is determined from the peak of your full inspiration to the trough created by your full expiration. Never does the waveform hit zero, however, as there will always be residual air volume that cannot be expelled forcefully by the person being tested. While a person may be able to move considerable amounts of air into and out of the lungs, not all of that air is necessarily useful, so to speak, as gas exchange occurs only within the alveoli. There is no gas exchange that occurs in the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, or alveolar ducts. As a result, all of those spaces are considered to be anatomic dead space. The oxygen in the air that is within the lungs is only useful if it can reach the alveoli. Stated another way, the anatomic dead space in the airway is the sum of all the air in the airway above the level of the alveoli. This makes the alveoli very important in the respiratory process, and this is where we must also define physiologic dead space and lung compliance. Physiologic dead space refers to damaged alveoli that cannot participate in gas exchange in addition to the anatomic dead space that already exists within a healthy airway. While anatomic dead space is pretty consistent among similar sized patients, physiologic dead space can vary significantly from person to person given different respiratory ailments. In many instances, issues with alveoli preventing adequate gas exchange can occur due to problems with lung compliance, or pulmonary compliance as it is called in some resources. Lung compliance is a measure of the lung's ability to stretch and expand. Not enough or low lung compliance means the lungs are stiff, making it difficult to inhale adequate volumes of air without extra effort. Fibrosis is an ailment that correlates with low lung compliance. On the other side of the spectrum is too much or high lung compliance, whereby the alveoli lack elasticity and cannot recoil effectively, making it difficult to exhale adequate volumes of air. Emphysema and COPD are ailments that result in high lung compliance. While it is easy to associate the lungs and airways with the respiratory system, the movement of air into and out of the lungs is of little value if there is no way for the oxygen in that air to enter the body while byproducts of cellular respiration, carbon dioxide in particular, has no means by which to leave the body. This is where the respiratory system interfaces and shares some components with the circulatory system. External respiration, as previously discussed, is where gases are exchanged between the air in the alveoli and the alveolar or pulmonary capillaries. Internal respiration is the movement of gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and the individual cells in the body. The vehicle that moves these gases between the lungs and the cells of the body is the blood within the circulatory system. Oxygen, in particular, is transported by hemoglobin in the blood. 
Hemoglobin is an iron-containing molecule that has a high affinity for oxygen molecules. A normal, healthy hemoglobin molecule will typically bind with four oxygen molecules. A hemoglobin molecule that has oxygen bound to it is called oxyhemoglobin. Oxygen binds to hemoglobin easiest in an alkaline environment. As the body and bloodstream become more acidic, less oxygen binds to the available hemoglobin. At normal atmospheric pressure, arterial blood in a healthy person will typically be saturated with 95-98% to oxygen. Venous blood, which is considered to be deoxygenated as that is blood returning to the lungs from the rest of the body, still has about 75% oxygen saturation as a normal person's capacity to carry and deliver oxygen within the bloodstream exceeds the oxygen needs of the body's cells under normal conditions. As the body demands more oxygen due to work, such as exercise or a disease process, this additional capacity may be reduced or eventually prove inadequate. Carbon dioxide, the waste product of cellular respiration by comparison, is transported through the blood predominantly as bicarbonate attached to hydrogen ions. These bicarbonate ions are created when carbon dioxide combines with water. Only a small percentage, about 8% of carbon dioxide, is dissolved in blood plasma and only about 20% is attached to hemoglobin. Because carbon dioxide attaches to amino groups of the hemoglobin while oxygen attaches to iron in the hemoglobin, both oxygen and carbon dioxide can be transported by a given hemoglobin molecule at the same time. Given the importance of the circulatory system in delivering oxygen to cells while removing carbon dioxide, it is clear to see how simply breathing air into and out of the lungs does not necessarily mean the body's cells are being oxygenated. If there is something that impedes the flow of blood into the pulmonary or alveolar capillaries, this creates what is known as a ventilation-perfusion mismatch. Ventilation in this context is often abbreviated as V, while perfusion is abbreviated as a capital Q. Thus, a ventilation perfusion mismatch is often simply referred to as a VQ mismatch. The VQ ratio is the amount of air that reaches the alveoli divided by the amount of blood flow in the capillaries in the lungs. Generally, there can be up to 4 liters of air in the respiratory tract, while up to 5 liters of blood can flow through the pulmonary capillaries in a minute, producing a VQ ratio of 0.8. A number higher or lower than 0.8 creates what is known as a VQ mismatch. Adequate blood flow will be of little help to someone in an oxygen-deficient atmosphere, such as a confined space. Inversely, being in an oxygen-rich atmosphere is of little comfort if the blood in the body is not reaching the pulmonary capillaries, as could be the case for someone suffering from a pulmonary embolism. The module on respiratory ailments will explore various causes for VQ mismatches in greater depth. Beyond the information already covered, several additional components are required for the body to move air into and out of the lungs. We already recognize the importance of intact airway structures and a patent open airway, along with the role played by the circulatory and muscular systems. One thing that was somewhat glossed over thus far, but is just as important, is an intact and functioning nervous system to include the central nervous system, spinal cord, phrenic nerve, and intercostal nerves. In most instances, breathing is an involuntary process. While a person can consciously control his or her breathing, the routine process of breathing is automatic. The main control center for breathing is the medulla oblongata, which is sensitive to carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. As the body, or the cerebrospinal fluid more specifically, becomes acidic due to elevated levels of carbon dioxide, the byproduct of cellular metabolism, chemoreceptors in the medulla recognize those changes, and the body's respiratory center sends impulses to the phrenic nerve to contract the diaphragm while also sending impulses to the intercostal muscles. This causes the diaphragm to flatten and move down, while the intercostal muscles pull the ribs out and up, increasing the intrathoracic area, which decreases the pressure within the thoracic cavity, resulting in air moving into the lungs given the pressure difference between the lower pressure space in the lungs and the higher pressure environment in which the person is breathing. 
As the lungs stretch, mechanoreceptors in the smooth muscles of the bronchi, bronchioles, and visceral pleura activate something known as the hearing brewer reflex, which tells the medulla to stop sending messages to the muscles to contract, thus preventing overinflation of the lungs. The diaphragm and intercostal muscles then relax, reducing the intrathoracic space, which subsequently increases the air pressure within the lungs. As the external atmosphere now has a lower air pressure than that within the lungs, the person exhales as the excess air in the lungs leaves the body until equilibrium is once again reached between the air pressure in the lungs and the air pressure in the external environment. Additional chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic arteries also monitor the oxygen and acid levels in the blood and serve as a backup system in the event ventilation is not initiated by the medulla. In this particular system, the main driving factor of ventilation is not necessarily the body's need for oxygen. Rather, it is the need to expel carbon dioxide, and the introduction of fresh oxygen into the lungs as part of this process is simply a positive byproduct of this mechanism or impetus for breathing. Some individuals, however, tend to be more acidic or have more carbon dioxide in their system, which can eventually defeat this mechanism of breathing. Chronic smokers or people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are common examples of individuals who may have routine elevated levels of carbon dioxide within their bloodstream. Over time, the body becomes accustomed to these higher levels of carbon dioxide and the body's primary respiratory drive based upon elevated carbon dioxide levels no longer functions. Such individuals then have to rely upon something known as their hypoxic drive. Rather than the body breathing to eliminate excess carbon dioxide, it breathes because it needs oxygen. The problem with relying upon the body's hypoxic drive is that the chemoreceptors in the brain, aorta, and carotid arteries are easily satisfied, for lack of a better term, with relatively minimal levels of oxygen within the blood. Thus, the hypoxic drive is not as strong as the body's primary respiratory mechanism of monitoring carbon dioxide levels in the body. While not necessarily something we think about with regard to routine ventilation, the body also has irritant receptors within the epithelial cells in airway mucous membranes that stimulate the vagus nerves when foreign bodies such as smoke, dust, fumes, pollen, or whatever are detected in the airway, resulting in a protective reflex like coughing. In a previous module, we discussed the body's acid-base balance. If you recall from that discussion, the body has three primary ways to regulate its acid-base balance, the bicarbonate buffer system, the respiratory process, and through the renal system. The bicarbonate buffer system is the fastest system, if you will, for maintaining the acid-base balance, while the renal system is the slowest. In the middle, as far as the speed of the process is concerned, is the respiratory system, which can respond as needed to help the body maintain its acid-base balance. It does this by exhaling carbon dioxide, which is an acid. The more air the body can expel within a given period of time, the more carbon dioxide can be removed, thus raising the body's pH, making it more alkaline and less acidic. Later in your paramedic course, you will learn about capnography and how to monitor the amount of carbon dioxide a person is exhaling. That information can be very important in helping the paramedic in the field determine whether a patient may be acidic or alkaline. This is where it becomes important in the discussion to recognize the difference between respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and metabolic alkalosis. As the volume of exhaled air, tidal volume, increases over a consistent time frame, more carbon dioxide is exhaled, resulting in greater alkalinity within the body. This results in respiratory alkalosis. A common scenario where respiratory alkalosis results is a person hyperventilating. Due to the increased rate of breathing, the person is exhaling more carbon dioxide than usual, which elevates the person's pH in the body, meaning they are more alkaline. The result is usually being lightheaded and dizzy. By having a person breathe into a bag, the theory is that the person inhales a higher percentage of carbon dioxide than typically in the atmosphere by rebreathing some of the carbon dioxide that is now in the bag into which the person just exhaled. Inversely, shallow, slow, or labored breathing can result in a diminished exhalation of tidal volume, resulting in the retention of carbon dioxide, making the person acidic 
the pH in the body is lowered. An extreme example is a person in respiratory arrest, typically also associated with cardiac arrest. When the person first enters this state, the cells in the body are still functioning and producing carbon dioxide. Because the person is no longer breathing on his or her own, however, carbon dioxide is not being exhaled from the body, resulting in respiratory acidosis. To take that example one step further, at some point that person in cardiac arrest depletes the oxygen available within the body and the cells must begin functioning anaerobically without oxygen. This creates lactic acid. Without a fully functioning means to remove that excess acid, the body enters a state of metabolic acidosis, which in this case is also compounded by the respiratory acidosis that is also going on. This is why some paramedic protocols require the administration of sodium bicarbonate to help neutralize some of that acid and increase the body's pH. While this example looks at a person who recently became a pulseless non-breather, metabolic acidosis can occur in conscious people for other reasons, such as increased acid product, loss of bicarbonate, or kidney problems. Such metabolic acidosis may actually impact the person's breathing as the body tries to use the respiratory system to exhale more carbon dioxide, resulting in Kussmaul respirations where rapid, deep breaths are used by the body to try and mitigate the acidosis. In comparison, metabolic alkalosis occurs when the pH in the body increases due to too many alkali-producing bicarbonate ions or too few acid-producing hydrogen ions. Common reasons for metabolic alkalosis include a loss of stomach acids, taking too many antacids, especially if the person already has kidney problems, use of diuretics, potassium deficiency, which can shunt hydrogen ions from within the interstitial fluid back into the cells, kidney failure, heart failure, liver failure, or genetic causes. As far as the respiratory system is concerned, if a person is experiencing metabolic alkalosis, his or her respiratory rate will typically be reduced as the body attempts to retain carbon dioxide by not exhaling so frequently. As you delve deeper into various medical ailments within your paramedic education, the impact of respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and metabolic alkalosis will become more evident. With that being said, as you proceed further into your paramedic education, many of the topics discussed within this module will be expanded upon and examined in greater detail. For the time being, however, we have reached the end of this module and you should now be able to describe the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. This presentation was prepared by Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and is distributed with an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, 4.0 International Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021, Waukesha County Technical College. For information on WCTC's numerous fire and EMS educational offerings, please visit us online at wctc.edu.